at the bottom. We'll do all four verses here. On that first now. Years I spent in vanity and pride. We'll mention tonight. Um, remember, Miss Courtney, she's recovering from her surgery. Everything was 
went well, and she's home recovering, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, and then remember Brother Kobe, he's on his way home uh, from Albania. I understand they uh, made it uh, back into Paris and um, and uh, have, a, a, I think, a 10-hour layover or so there, and then they'll be on home. So pray for them and uh, that they make it on in safely. And uh, we praise the Lord that uh, the Lord has blessed that trip and pray that they make them travel, give them traveling grace on home. Uh, and uh, continue to remember the preacher. He traveled, he and Brother Doug left out this morning going to Gillette, uh, Wyoming, and have started revival tonight through Friday night. Um, so pray about that meeting and pray for that specifically, uh, that the Lord would uh, bless, in, uh, bless in that meeting and, um, and touch there. And I'll ask any, any specific request. I don't really have anything in, by the way of announcements um, other than, you know, looking forward to what the Lord's got for us on Sunday. Of course, we'll be looking forward to being back in on Sunday. Um, any other additional prayer requests? Amen. Amen. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. All right, any others? Yes, sir, but how? Brother Kobe, I know I know I asked you this once the other day. I don't know what the date was. You said it was the week of the Passover. Yep. Uh, Steve Lee, that's who I prayed for. Sonny Waldo. Yep, yeah, Brother Mark mentioned him last night, men's prayer. Sonny Waldo is his name, and uh, his brother uh, Mann's uh, brother in law. He was going to have to try, travel to Florida to be with him. So pray for that situation. The, yes, the Page family, Brother Page. Yeah, his wife is not doing well, and uh, she's taking some medication that uh, has affected her muscles and various things as she deals with cancer. And uh, so pray for her, for sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Remember, remember that. All right. Oh, goodness. So remember that. Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, that heart rhythm stuff nothing to mess with, so we certainly need to be sure and pray, pray about that. Amen. All right. Any others? Yes, sir. All right, let's come around and pray, those that can and are able. If not, you can pray where you're at. Just have a time of prayer tonight before Brother Titus comes around to preach. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you, Lord, for your touch, your mercy, your grace, for carrying us thus far this week. Pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you'll encourage, guide, and direct tonight in every way. I pray that you'll anoint Brother Titus to preach, give him the power and the unction to preach what you put on his heart. And Lord, you've heard the request tonight. We pray for Miss Courtney that you'd continue to touch her and raise her up, strengthen her, help her to heal fully. Lord, we pray and we're trusting thy touch and hand be upon her. And Lord God, we pray for Brother Colby and his traveling companion as they head home. Lord, I pray that you'd Give them traveling grace on home. Give them a safe flight. Uh, Lord, make things to go smoothly in airports and airport security and everything associated with that. And Lord, I pray that you'd touch there. And I pray that you'd bless, uh, Lord, with the opportunity to go back, preach in the jails there. And dear Heavenly Father, we trust, uh, Lord, that you'll touch and work uh, in every way in that. And Lord, I pray for the various requests we've heard tonight, various sicknesses, some facing cancer and uh, not so good diagnosis, Lord, and the ones with heart rhythm issues and uh, all the various needs, dear Heavenly Father, that were mentioned tonight. Uh, Lord, if I tried to mention each one, I'd probably forget one, but Lord, we know you heard them. Uh, Lord, you know every need. 
uh, every circumstance, dear Heavenly Father, and each and every uh, matter of the heart, Lord, and uh, Lord, every physical ailment and every situation, Lord, you know it, and we trust that you'll touch. Bless, I pray that you'll be with our family. She's there in, in uh, Wyoming, uh, Wyoming with Brother Doug there at Jer Jericho Baptist Church. I pray that you'd anoint uh, in the meeting that you'll bless the church and bless the people. Lord, that you'd encourage them, and Lord, that you'd manifest yourself in that meeting. Uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for giving them the opportunity to go. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, blessing with that opportunity to go and preach, and I pray that you'd meet with them in those services. Lord, all the various needs, all of our missionaries, all of those serving, uh, Lord, in foreign fields, dear Heavenly Father, where you've called them and uh, where you've put them, Lord, and whether it's uh, here in America or whether it's foreign field, Lord, you know, uh, Lord, the needs, you know, their, their uh, various needs, and Lord, I pray that you'd work uh, in each and every ministry, Lord, and use them mightily, we pray. We pray for Brother Hewitt as he's there in Bakia, uh, running the tent meeting this week, I pray. We thank you, Lord, for the news we've heard already of some being saved. We pray, Lord, that you continue. Uh, Lord, to work there. I pray if there's any here tonight that's lost and undone without you, uh, Lord, I pray that they'd heed your word. And Lord, if you draw them, uh, Lord, that they'd run to you tonight and be saved. And Lord, we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for it. Blessing the classes uh, tonight. The one of classes be with the teachers and the helpers. Lord, I pray if there's any child that's lost, that if you deal with them, Lord, that they'd run to you tonight. Pray for the buses as they head home here in a little while. Pray that you give them traveling grace and safety. And Lord, bless in every way. Bring us back safely on Sunday uh, and meet with us, Lord, we ask. We pray these things in thy name. Uh, Lord, if they be thy will. Amen. And amen. Amen. All right, Brother Titus, you come on. You give me your attention tonight and amen him and smile at him and, uh, and uh, ag him on and we're looking forward to hearing Brother, Brother Titus preach, okay? Amen. It's a joy to be in the house of the Lord this evening. I appreciate each and every one of you that are here tonight. I appreciate the privilege to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to preach. I know there's plenty of other preachers here tonight that uh, probably do a lot better job than me, but I surely appreciate the opportunity and the privilege, and, and I'm glad it's not necessarily in the man. If it was up to the man, we'd be in a mess. I'm glad it's up to him tonight, and I'm trusting him to help us and give us exactly what we need tonight. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in the book of Acts, chapter number 16. Acts, chapter number 16, for our text this evening. Try our best to show you the thought the Lord's lay on our hearts. I don't uh, plan on being long tonight, just a simple thought, but I hope and pray that uh, it'd be a help and a blessing to us. Acts, chapter number 16, I want to begin reading in verse number 16. Very familiar scripture for our text this evening. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. When her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. 
Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. When he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you once again this evening, Lord, I'm very thankful, Lord, and very honored, Lord, at the privilege to the Lord to stand and preach your word tonight. But God, I realize, Lord, I'm nothing without you. Lord, I'm just a vessel of clay tonight and nothing more. God, if anything good is said or done, it'll have to be through and by you tonight. I pray that nobody would see me. Lord, they'd see you high and lifted up and hear from heaven tonight. And I'd just be a mouthpiece, God, that you could use that you do the preaching tonight. And God, the Holy Ghost would take your word beyond our ears and plant it deep in our hearts, Lord, and convict us and, and, and show us, Lord, our needs tonight. Lord, I pray especially, Lord, if there'd be one here lost tonight and never been saved by the grace of God. That God the Holy Ghost would come by this way tonight and convict them and convince them, Lord, their need to be saved. Uh, uh, Lord, today could be the greatest day of their life, Lord, if they accept you uh, as their personal Savior, that they'd believe and trust in you and the finished work of Calvary. Lord, they could leave here forever changed. Uh, and Lord, for an, uh, Lord, for a new day, eternal destination. Uh, Lord, not going to hell anymore, but getting to go to heaven. I pray tonight, God, you'd have your willing way in all that's said and done. Lord, speak to us that are saved tonight. God, I pray for those that may be discouraged tonight. Uh, Lord, maybe going through things that don't understand why. I pray that God the Holy Ghost would speak to them and, and comfort them and encourage them and, and help them to keep going and to keep trusting. And Lord, once again, all that you do tonight, we'll try our very best to thank you and praise you for it. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name I humbly pray. And amen. amen. <clears throat> the thought that the Lord's laid on our heart for this evening, I'm interested in this Philippian jailer. Uh, we see the story how that Paul and Silas uh, uh, were going on their missionary journey to different cities and places uh, and God has uh, showed a vision of Paul uh, and called them to Macedonia and so they're making their way and diff going through different places and they stop at Philippi and we find this young lady, this damsel, the Bible said that was possessed with the spirit of divination and she followed them uh, and was proclaiming to everybody that they were servants of the Most High God, uh, which show unto us the way of salvation. It's sad today uh, that there's a lot of dark wickedness that knows more about the Lord uh, than the average person does. Uh, this woman that was possessed of a demon knew more about these men of God uh, than the average person did. Uh, and that Paul was grieved. The Bible said that he stopped and, and he told the, the Spirit to leave her and he, and he left her in Jesus' name. Uh, uh, but because of all this, her master her handlers, if you will, were upset because they've lost their income now. They didn't care what was wrong with her. Uh, they didn't care what she was going through or what was happening to her on the inside. Uh, uh, they just liked what they could gain from it, what they could benefit from it. Uh, ain't that the way it is today, a world full of people? Uh, uh, they don't care about nobody but themselves. Uh, don't care what nobody else is going through. Just what benefits me? Uh, uh, what, what's going to help me? What's going to be good for me? What's in it for me? Uh, and so they got upset because Paul's now messed up their income. They seen that the hope of their gains was gone. They lost it. They were upset about it. So they made a big deal about it and ended up having Paul and Silas beaten and whipped and thrown into prison. We find here in this story, we find this jailer. We don't know his name, uh, uh, but we assume he's a Philippian jailer because he lives there at Philippi. And he's a jailer and he's been charged uh, to keep these men in the prison. It's a charge to keep them at all costs. To, never, to not let them out, not to let them escape, not to let it be known that they're there, uh, uh, to keep them at all costs. Not only to keep them, but, uh, but it looks like to me it's, it's unto death. I mean, his life uh, absolutely depends uh, on him keeping these prisoners locked up. Say, so how do you know it was unto death? Because as soon as he thinks they're gone, uh, he just goes ahead and starts to take his own life because he knows that's what's going to happen. Go ahead and get it over with because my, I mean, he knew that his life depended upon it. The yeah. Bible said such a charge. This was not no small task, no small charge. Uh, uh, maybe the greatest charge this man has ever been given in his career as a jailer. Uh, keep these men at all costs for your life depends on it. We notice his charge. Uh, I want to notice also his contentment. 
He took all the precautions and all the things, Brother Howard, he deemed necessary to keep them locked up. The Bible said that he put them in the innermost part of the prison. I mean the very center. No telling, Brother Andrew, how many locked doors they were behind. Not just one or two. I mean, in the innermost prison, as deep and as dark in that place as he could possibly get to him in, uh, uh, probably away from any windows, uh, probably away from anything outside, uh, as deep and as dark into that jail as he could get them in. He put them in the innermost part behind multiple locked doors. Uh, he said, that'll take care of it. But just in case it don't, he even took it another step further. He locked them in stocks. The Bible said he chained them up. They're in the innermost part of the prison behind, no doubt, multiple locked doors. And he also chains them inside that innermost part of the prison. He looks back and says, yep, that ought to do it. That ought to take care of it. That ought to be sufficient. That ought to be more than enough. Uh, uh, no man can get out of the, all this that I put them in. Uh, I, everything should be just fine. Uh, nothing to worry about. He's content in the things that he's done. He's content with the precautions that he has taken, the measures that he has taken to see to it that everything goes according to plan. He's content so much that he's calloused. He's a cold and calloused man. I don't find any compassion. I don't find any mercy toward Paul and Silas. I mean, they've been beaten and they've been whipped. Uh, I mean, their, their clothes have been rent off of them. They've been striped, the Bible said. Uh, and I find no compassion. I find no comfort, uh, uh, no mercy on these men whatsoever. He's a calloused man. Uh, he's not interested in doing nothing but his job and taking care of him. And he is, uh, he's not only calloused, he's, he's calloused because he's not moved by what they say or what they do. Uh, he's also pretty comfortable. He goes off to sleep. No worries. Middle of the night. They're in their innermost part of the prison. They're locked in chains. Brother Chris, they're not going anywhere. I've got nothing to worry about. Everything's took care of. I've got this figured out. I've got it handled. Everything's A-OK. -okay. He's comfortable. He's so comfortable he's going off to sleep. He hears a bunch of commotion going on of singing and praising and praying and he's not worried about it. He's not troubled. He's, he's not bothered by it. He's, he's not moved by it. He's just going right off to sleep. He's content in what he's done and in his actions and the measures that he has taken. He feels it, it is enough. But then I want to notice very quickly his calamity. Everything's fine, he thinks. He goes off to sleep, uh, but then there's a much bigger commotion takes place. There's an earthquake. The Bible said that it, that it shook the very foundations of the prison that, so that all the doors uh, were opened and all the bands, I mean even the stocks fell off and were loosed. That's not an ordinary earthquake. I mean, I could see the doors opening maybe from all the shaking, but what in the world would cause the stocks to just fall off of them? That's not an ordinary earthquake. That earthquake shook that whole prison and, and opened everything up, but I dare say to you tonight, it didn't just shake the prison, but it shook a man also. It shook a man's heart, a, a man that was once callous and cold, a, a man that was once comfortable where he was and, and the measures that he had taken, thinking that everything was okay in life, uh, that he didn't have nothing to worry about, uh, uh, nothing to fear, I've got this under control, I'm okay. Uh, uh, now all of a sudden he's in a world of mess. He's in trouble. He's in so much trouble, Brother Howard, he sees all those doors open, he automatically assumes that they've done what most any other prisoners would do. They're going to escape. They're going to flee. They're going to, they're going to take hold of that freedom that's been opened up, up to them. He knows that his life depended on this charge to keep these men bound, and so he goes ahead and decides he's going to end it. Go ahead and get it over with, brother man. I'm just going to go ahead and take care of it. I don't know what they'll put me through, what they may do to me. I'm just going to go ahead and end it quickly. And he draws his own sword to kill himself. He sees his calamity. He found out real quick like that it was revealed to him that what he had done wasn't enough after all. His actions, his measures, his precautions and, and his ability uh, uh, wasn't enough after all. It wasn't enough to get the job done. It wasn't enough to keep the charge. It wasn't enough uh, to save his life from destruction and, and the consequences of failing the charge that was given to him. And it's revealed to him that it wasn't enough. All that he had done and all the comfort that it brought him, what he had done. And one day he found out it wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. He, re he realized that it was out of his control. It's out of his I mean, who, how was he supposed to know it was going to be a great big earthquake? 
How is he supposed to know all these things is going to take place? Uh, and he realizes he's in trouble. And he starts to kill himself, starts to take his own life. But thank God there's a man of God that cries. Amen. Paul cried. He said, do thyself no harm. Wait a minute. Stop. Stop what you're doing. Stop where you're at. Uh, there's no need to take your life. There's, you don't have to die today. Uh, uh, we're all still here. Everything's still okay, Brother Chris. It's not too late for you yet. It's not over with yet. Uh, it's, this ain't the end for you yet. Uh, it doesn't have to end here tonight. He cries, stop. Stop where you're at. It was a cry that led to salvation. I'm amazed when they cried out to him and they stopped him from taking his own life. He comes running and trembling. And he falls before him, Brother Matt. I'm amazed at what he said. I mean, you can't say it no more plainer. Sirs, what must I do? What must I do? Almost sounds like he's heard about this before. Almost sounds like he's, Brother Adam, somewhere along the way, sometime or another, he's heard a little bit about, about this before. What must I do to be saved? I don't know when, I don't know how, but sometime in his life, he's heard something before. He knows he knows the right question to ask, something that may have been troubling him and bothering him for quite some time. And he says, sirs, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? He says, I realize that I can't, I realize that, that, that in my ability, uh, I'm weak, I'm fallible, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm incapable, I'm not able, uh, I can't save myself, sirs, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? I'm glad they knew what to tell him. I'm glad they knew what to do. I'm glad it led to salvation. I'm glad they told him the way of salvation. They told him how to get... Hey, that, that woman that was possessed, she knew exactly what she's talking about. She said that they show unto us the way of salvation. Aren't you glad for somebody that can show somebody the way of salvation? Notice they didn't say or repeat after me prior. They didn't go and automatically dunk him in water. They didn't say you need to go do this, you need to go do that. Uh, all they said was simply believe. That's all they said. There wasn't none of this great big thing that they had to go through and do. Uh, he said believe. Believe and thou shalt. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I'm glad it was not only good enough for him, but they told him in your whole house, not just you, but if not only you, uh, uh, but anybody and everybody in your house, it's good for everybody. He is enough for you. He's enough for your children. He's enough for your mom and your daddy. He's enough for your wife. Uh, he's enough for everybody in your house. If you'll just believe, thou shalt be saved. I'm glad it's a salvation that went beyond him, but it was good for everybody. Notice his conversion. Notice the change in his countenance. We find him one moment, he's on his knees trembling. He's scared to death. He goes from trembling to believing. He goes from an absolute panic. I mean, have you ever been there before? You ever found yourself in a situation, a place where you just almost in absolute panic, scared, don't know what to do? He goes from absolute panic to peace. I mean, just like that. I'm glad salvation's instant. I, I, sanctification may be, a, may be something that we grow and we do, but I'm glad salvation itself is insta instant. It's spontaneous. I'm glad it's not some, uh, something we got to work through and do. Uh, but I'm glad immediately from the time that we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I'm glad we're saved by the grace of God. We're sealed. Uh, uh, we're washed. We're made clean. We're forgiven all in a moment. That thief on the cross didn't have time to go and fix a bunch of things and do a bunch of things different. He's dying. He said, Lord, remember me. You say, what was so special about that? I believe, I believe the key was he believed who he was, who he said he was. He called him Lord. He said he believed upon him. The change in his countenance. Then I want to notice this. Notice his care for these men. He goes from no mercy, no compassion, locking him up in the innermost part of the prison and fastening stocks upon him, binding him. Now he's taking him home with him. He's taking him home with him. He's washing all those stripes. 
He's caring for them. He's feeding them. He's giving of what He has back to them in appreciation and, and in love and compassion. I still believe when a man gets saved by the grace of God, there's a love of God that comes in his heart and he'll have a new love for, for mankind. He'll have a new love for his brother. He'll have a new love even for those he never got along with before, uh, those he may not necessarily care for, uh, uh, but he has a new love in his heart when he gets saved by the grace of God. Man gets saved by the grace of God and man that's right with God will have love for other people. That, that comes with it. That's part of the deal. That's part of the package is love for others. Is that not what he told him? He said, you know that you're my disciples? That love, it is, a, it is evidence. It's proof of a, of, of a change in someone's life. I said all that to say this. I look back on my life as a 13-year-old boy. Brother Adam, I'd, I'd made some precautions. I had took some steps. I'd made some measures in my life. I'd done some things, Brother Handel, that I felt like was good enough. I felt like it was enough. Uh, it would be all right, Brother R.B., what I had done. Uh, uh, my little profession as a seven-year-old boy on Easter Sunday morning, uh, uh, going down an altar and saying I wanted to get saved. Uh, I didn't have no idea what it meant like to, what it meant to be lost. Uh, I didn't know what it was like to be under conviction. Uh, I didn't know what it meant to truly be saved. I just know everybody wanted to be. Uh, it was a good thing, and I wanted to be too. And I held on to that, Brother Howard, just as long as I possibly could. I held on to that little profession I made. I, I held on to my baptism. I remember when they dumped me in the creek. I, I held on to my church membership. I, I could tell you where I went to church. I, I could tell you my daddy was a pastor. I, I could tell you the messages that was preached the week before. I, I could tell you the songs that was sung. I, I could tell you what was taught in Sunday school. And I just kept on holding. I thought I'd done enough. I thought the measures that I'd taken was enough. It was going to get me there. Everything was going to be all right. I was settled. I was calloused. And I was comfortable. I was comfortable going through the motions. I knew how to walk. I knew how to talk. I knew how to look like a Christian. That's all I'd ever known. I'd been raising it all my life, Brother Howard. I was good at it. I'd been raised to do so. But that's all I was doing was acting. That's all I was doing was, was pretending. Ain't it amazing how God knows how to get your attention? Thank God He knows how to get your attention. Thank God He knows how to show you when you're wrong and when, and when you don't have what you need. I'm glad He knows how to get your attention. And as a 13-year-old boy, God began to get my attention. God began to send that Holy Ghost conviction my way and begin to trouble my heart. I began to be troubled and begin to wonder, had I really done enough? Had I, uh, uh, what I'd done, was it really good enough, Brother Nathaniel, to get me there? Uh, I wasn't really going to carry me all the way to heaven one day. I was beginning to be troubled. Calamity came in this man's life. God got his attention. I remember, I remember very well. As a 12 or 13 year old boy, me and Papa was going way up in the mountains to go fishing. I'm talking about way out of society, way out of civilization. Most people couldn't find it if they had to. We loved going up there. We knew where all the good holes were, where all the trout liked to stay. And man, we loved to go up there, me and Papa. There wasn't nothing for miles and miles and miles up there, just one gravel road. There was three or four campers up there, and that was it. We was up our fishing one day. We stopped this bridge and a good stretch of creek. Papa told me, he said, you start here at the bridge and fish your way down. I'm going to walk down the road and I'm going to go a good ways. I'm going to get in and I'll fish up the stream and we'll meet in the middle. So I got my pole, I got my, got my creel and my tackle box, everything. I had, I had everything good to go. I knew what to do. I knew what to take. I, I'd been, this is something else I'd been doing all my life as well. Got in that creek out at the bridge, started fishing. Catching fish and, and just doing my own thing, not a care in the world. I worked my way down the creek, Brother Howard, just kept on the fishing, kept on the fishing, kept going a little further, kept going a little further, and time went on and elapsed further and longer and longer. And Brother Matt, I'm starting to get starting to wonder, where's Papa at? Where's Papa at? I went a long ways down this creek, Brother Chris. I fished a long time. There ain't no sign of him. All of a sudden, Brother Matt, I, I'm no longer interested in fishing anymore. I'm not having fun anymore, Brother Howard. I'm not enjoying myself anymore. No I'm not comfortable anymore. I'm troubled. I'm worried. 
Apple ain't nowhere to be found. I thought, well, maybe, maybe he got tired of fishing and got out of the creek and just walked back up the road up to the truck. So I got out of the creek and I went, I went up to the truck. No sign of him. I hollered for him. I looked for him. Nowhere to be found, Brother Adam. I'm starting to get real upset now. I'm troubled. I'm worried. I start walking down the road looking, looking in the creek trying to find him anywhere. I go a long ways, and brother, or at least what seemed like a long ways to me. No sign of him anywhere. And the thought comes into my mind, the Lord's come back and I've missed it. That's it. Brother Adam, I, I, I'm in trouble now. I've been playing too long. I've been messing around too long. I've been worried what people's going to think about me too long. I've been, holding to, I've been holding to some empty things. Uh, I've been holding to some, 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 some deeds that I've done and that's all they are, just actions that I've took. Uh, I don't have anything that's real uh, and I've messed up and I've missed out. I began to think in my mind, I remember there was a phone in one of those campers up there. I broke a run. I know how to drive. I broke a run. I'm telling you, when adrenaline kicks in, you can go a lot further and a lot faster than you thought you could. I'm scared to death, Brother Adam. I mean, I, I, I'm afraid I'm left behind. But all my loved ones, all my family are gone, and I'm doomed. That's all that's going through my mind. I, might, I make my way up to that camper, and the first one that comes to my mind is Mamma. I knew early this morning we left her drinking her coffee at home. I knew she'd be there. I'm shaking, I'm dialing that phone number just as fast as I can dial it. One of the sweetest sounds I ever heard on the other end of that line was Mamma's voice. I'm talking about one of the sweetest, one of the best sound in my ears, Brother Randall, that I've ever heard in my life was Mamma's voice. I knew, whew, Lord ain't come back yet. Mamma's still here, I'm okay. I don't know where Papa is, but I know where Mamma is, I'm okay. A little while later, here comes Papa driving up the road in the truck, looking and wondering what in the world has happened to him. I tell Mama, I'm, here comes Papa, I gotta go, love you. I tried to play it off like there's nothing wrong. I just called, I told her I just called to check on her, Brother Adam. I didn't want nobody to know if there's anything wrong with me. Everything's all right. Ain't nothing wrong. I'm not worried about nothing. Everything's just fine. Just one call her. She knew something was up. That wasn't like me just to do that out of the blue in the middle of the day. We're fishing. I ain't worried about nothing else most of the time. How comes Papa? I got to go. He's looking where, he's wondering where I'm at. I went about normal life again. But I'm troubled on the inside. Brother Howard, I'm doing everything I can not to let it show. I don't want nobody to know, Brother Chris, there's something bad wrong on the inside of my heart. Many a sleepless nights, I'm wrestling, I'm worried, I'm tossing. Nights that I was scared to death, Lord, come back. Wake up out of, out of sleep and Go downstairs in mom and dad's room, just peek open the door and see if I can hear somebody snoring or see somebody laying there in bed. Scared to death. I'm telling you not, I'm glad the Lord knows how to get your attention. I'm glad God knows. I'm glad He knows how to speak. I know, I'm glad He knows how to put it in front of you, how to make it very real to you beyond a shadow of a doubt of what your need is and He knows how to get a hold of you. I'm glad, thank God, Holy Ghost conviction still works. I'm glad He's still able to take somebody and show them their need to be saved, that they're lost, and that they're on their way to hell, that their church membership ain't going to get them there, or that baptism ain't going to do them no good, or going down to an altar and don't necessarily do anything for them. Thank God for Holy Ghost conviction. You'll not get saved without it. You'll not get saved without it. I tried the first time. I didn't even know what it meant to be lost, much less to be saved. That's all it was, a profession. It was just an empty action. That's all it was. I wonder how many people are sitting in church tonight holding on to an empty action. You say, here's your first, here's your first problem. You say, well, I, I did this. I did that. Trust me, I've been there. I prayed every prayer you could imagine. I'd even write them out, same words, and rearrange them in different order. I was miserable. I was dead set, Brother Matt. It was in some special prior or some special action, some ritual or something that I didn't do just right. Even after I got saved, I still struggled there for a little while with doubt. 
I wanted to be sure. Did I do something wrong? Did I do everything just exactly right? And I tossed and I turned and I struggled and I battled. I was miserable for a long time. You know why the devil, you know why the devil wants you to doubt? Because as long as you're doubting your own salvation, you ain't never going to lead nobody else to salvation. Until you get your own salvation settled, you'll never be able to point anybody else. As long as you're doubting and worrying about yourself, you're inactive. You're, you're, not, you're not beneficial to the cause of Christ until you get your own salvation settled and nailed down. When I finally got it settled, nailed down, I got tired of all the prayers and all the acting and all the, all the doing. I finally come to the end of myself. I said, God, I can't do this. I said, God, if it's up to me, I'm never going to make it. Oh, how true that was. I said, Lord, I'm tired of holding in a, in a profession. I'm tired of holding in, in, a, in, in a time of going to the altar. I'm tired of holding on a special certain prayer that I can concoct or come up with in my mind. Uh, uh, Lord, all I've got to do, all I've got left to do, all I know to do, Lord, I'm just going to hold on to you. Uh, I'm not going to hold on to me anymore. I'm not going to hold on to what I've done uh, or what I could do. Uh, uh, but Lord, I'm just going to hold on to you. Uh, I'm just going to hold you as hard uh, and as tight as I can. Uh, and if I get there, it's going to have to be by you. Brother Adam, one of the greatest things I ever realized in my life, when I started holding on to him, I realized he's holding to me. The, whole, the one that holds the whole world. Uh, uh, Brother Randall holds the whole world in the palm of his hand. Uh, uh, that sets the stars in the sky and the sun and the moon. Uh, uh, the very God of this world. Uh, I realized that I was holding on to him uh, and he was holding on to me. Friend, I'm here to tell you now, if you're trusting some action, if you're trusting some deed that you've done, uh, uh, some, uh, some visit to the altar, uh, I believe in coming and praying in the altar, uh, but if that's all it was, was just a visit to an altar, uh, I'd make sure it wasn't just something empty. I'd make sure it'd hold water tonight. I'd make sure it'd get me there. I'm telling you, eternity's too long and hell's too hot to, to not know for sure. I don't know why God put this message on my heart, but I know He did. I don't believe it. I don't believe it's. I don't believe it's for nothing either. I believe it's for somebody. You may be here tonight. You've gone through the motions for a long time. You're holding on to some profession, some trip to the altar. You're holding on to some act or some deed. Uh, uh, but that's all it is. It's just empty actions. Uh, uh, there, it won't hold any weight to it. Uh, it doesn't give you peace at night. Uh, uh, you're troubled. Uh, uh, you're worried, but you don't want nobody to know. Uh, uh, you wonder what everybody's going to think. Uh, I'm telling you, friend, I'd rather be in heaven than be in hell worried what everybody thought. I'm glad on a Monday night or if I was a 13-year-old boy, I quit worrying about what everybody else thought and said, I've got to get saved. I'm telling you, I don't want to take it for granted anybody's saved. I'll never forget, I'll never forget the day my mama got saved. The shock of my life. And God showed me real quick like, you don't need to take it for granted that anybody's saved. I'm telling you, Brother Randall, if I thought anybody saved, it was mama. If I thought anybody was going to heaven, Brother Howard, it was mama. I'll never forget the day that she walked the aisle just a squalling. She, she yanked on my arm. It was a chapel service on Wednesday morning at the Christian school we were at. As a 16-year-old boy, Daddy was off preaching, wanted me to preach chapel that, that, that Wednesday morning. I remember telling Daddy, Daddy, I ain't got nothing but hell. That's all I've got. I don't have anything else to preach, Brother Randall, but hell, that's all that's on my heart. Daddy said, you better preach what's on your heart, what God puts on your heart. I'll never forget that morning. The car didn't want to crank. It was falling a flood. I had to walk down the rain to Mamma's house to borrow a car. I had a sore throat. It seemed like everything in the world was just, was just fighting against me. I didn't know why hell was the only message I had on my heart. I got up and preached the best I could, and I gave invitation, not really expecting anything. And I'll never forget my mama stepping down the aisle just a squalling bawling her eyes out and I thought well she's, she's burdened about somebody she's troubled she's worried she's burdened about somebody she jerked my arm down there and she said I'm lost 
and I need to be saved. I'm telling you, Brother Howard, if she needed my help, she's in trouble. I couldn't do a thing well for her. I was there, I, I'm telling you, I was there in shock, Brother Randall. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. Uh, uh, tears began to roll down my face. And I just laid there and cried a little while in that altar. Uh, I'm glad she didn't need no help. Uh, I'm glad she didn't need nobody to tell her what to do. Uh, uh, she had told many others what to do before. Uh, uh, but she began to pray and cry and ask the Lord to save her. I'm glad everybody needs to be saved tonight everybody needs to be saved when God shakes your heart when God makes it real to you and shows you your loss that's the time to do something about it realize that I couldn't get there he's the only way I'll say this and I'm through you may be here tonight and you may be saved by the grace of God you know beyond a shout out you're saved and you're going to heaven but God's allowed things in your life that's awful unpleasant right now Awful uncomfortable right now. Paul and Silas just going around trying to tell people about Jesus. That's all they're doing. Trying to tell people about Jesus. They strip their clothes off of them. They beat them and they whip them. They throw them in the deepest, darkest part of the prison and leave them there. I don't know about you, but I know if that's me, I'd be a bitter individual. I'd be upset, Brother Howard. But I'm telling you, I'd be upset. Brother Adam, they would, it'd be awful hard for me to sing praises and, and, and pray at that moment. It'd be real hard not to be upset. Lord, uh, I don't understand this. Lord, what are you doing? Why, why are you allowing this into my life? Uh, I'm just trying to do what you called me to do. My back hurts. It's cold and it's dark. It's wet in here. Lord, why? Sometimes God will allow trouble in our lives physical trouble in our lives to show somebody else the spiritual trouble in their life had they not been there in that deep dark part of that prison that Philippian jailer would have never known what it was how to be saved by the grace of God maybe you're here tonight and God's letting you go through something you don't understand why you're trying your best to do what God wants you to do and God's allowed trouble in your life just remember God may allow physical trouble in your life so God can use you to point out the spiritual trouble in somebody else's. There may be somebody, through whatever it is that you're going through, you're going to come in contact with somebody. It needs to be saved by the grace of God. And God wants you to be the tool to show them their need. I don't know your heart. If we've got a moment, if that's all right, Brother Matt, if Miss Julianne come and get us a song on the piano, I feel impressed. I feel impressed just for a minute as we stay in the night. I don't know your heart. I don't know where you're at with the Lord. I don't know who's saved. I don't know who's lost. I don't know who's troubled. I don't know who's worried. That's between you and God tonight. And I've tried my best to deliver what the Lord laid on my heart. If you're here tonight and never been saved by the grace of God, God the Holy Ghost just shook your heart tonight. Showed you that empty works is nothing to hold on to. It won't hold weight. It won't get you there. I don't care how many professions you've made. I don't care how long you've been a church member. I don't care if you've been baptized. Those actions will not get you there. They're good actions. They're good things. But if you're trusting anything besides Him, you're trusting works, that won't get you there. You'll, you'll get there trusting in Him or you won't get there. It's the finished work of Calvary and what He done. It's not anything. It's not in us. I realize, Lord, I can't get there. I'm just going to hold on to you. Boy, did I get peace and I just started holding on to Him. What are you holding on to tonight? What are, you, what are you counting on? I'm not interested in making anybody doubt. That's a, that's a miserable place to be. But I do want you to know for sure where you're going when you leave this world. Do you know for sure where you're going when you die? Is it settled? Is it sure in your heart? What are you holding on to? Preacher, I, I, I went to an altar one time in Bible school. Did you trust him? Are you trusting Him? Are you trusting in that trip? Or are you trusting in Him? Preacher, I've been a church member for a long time. Are you trusting in church membership? Or are you trusting in Him? God made it very real to me that nothing but Him, anything but Him won't work. It's got to be Him and Him alone. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't understand why. You're going through something you're going through. Maybe you need to pray, Lord, help me, as Paul and Silas did, not to be better, not to quit, 
but to keep saying, keep praising, keep praying. Somebody's watching. I don't know your heart as she plays. I want to give you opportunity to do business with God tonight. I don't know your heart. Maybe you need to come pray. I just feel impressed. Somebody might need an opportunity to come and pray and talk to the Lord. I bid you come and do business with God. Ain't nobody going to think nothing about you whatsoever. It's sad we've lived into a day that our children feel like altars just for lost folk. A lot of saved folk. I'm, I'm glad it ain't necessarily like that here, but you go to a lot of other churches. Saved, folk, saved people don't use the altar hardly anymore. I'm glad it's not just for when you're lost. I'm glad saved people can find some great help at the altar as well. I don't know your heart. I'm not going to drag it out, but I want to give you time to come. If you need to pray, I bid you to come and pray. I'm glad God knows all about it. God has the answers. Thank God you can not only be saved, but you can know it with full assurance. I'm glad he said in 1 John that you may know, not that you may hope, but you can go beyond hope. Say, preacher, I hope I get to heaven. You can, get, you can have more than just hope. You can know by the authority of God's holy words, you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt where you're going. Well, I don't have to hope, but I can know. Because I'm not trusting anything I can do or have done or haven't done. I'm trusting in Him. I asked Him to save me. That's all I can do. I ask Him to believe. The rest is up to him. We can't save nobody. Sure do appreciate your good attention. I appreciate the opportunity to preach with Matthew. Come on. I wouldn't tarry if the Lord spoke to you tonight. I wouldn't tarry. Nothing like the peace that comes with knowing. Lay down at night, close your eyes, be at peace. Know if the Lord comes back, where you're going to be. It makes life a lot easier to deal with when you got it taken care of and got it sealed. Signed and sealed, delivered. Psalm she says, Are you ready? Are you ready? I think you've heard that question tonight. I wasn't ready. I wouldn't leave. I wasn't ready. I appreciate Brother Titus preaching tonight. I appreciate the truth of God's Word. I appreciate him minding God. And I told, Brother, told Brother Randall, Brother Titus, I think probably the entire time that jailer was with them, they was probably preaching to him. He's probably sitting there in shackles preaching to him. <laughs> he said, now tell me how to be saved. And, uh, and God made a quick believer out of him, shook him, shook him. And uh, I wouldn't wait till God had to shake me and, break the, and, and make the walls fall down around you to wake you up. 
appreciate the preaching. It's been a blessing to be in the Lord's house. I thank you uh, for your attention. appreciate you preaching, Brother Titus. appreciate you minding God. And uh, if, if the Lord's dealt with you and you're here and lost and you didn't move or, uh, or the Lord's dealing with your heart and you need to talk to somebody, we're here. We're not going to rush off. Uh, we'll pray with you. We'll um, get our Bible and show you what the Word of God says about being saved, how to be saved. And we'll, we'll take as much time as we need, and uh, I wouldn't leave lost. Looking forward to what the Lord's got for us on Sunday. Be much in prayer for services. Of course, we'll have everything, regular services on Sunday. Remember the prayer requests we've heard tonight. And uh, Brother Darren, will you mind grabbing one of those plates back there and setting it in that on the on the middle back there might be one should be one underneath the seats back there somewhere and uh that'll be if you'll drop your wanna offering in as you go by 